We are the Danes. And as all the world knows, we have been a peace-loving people, promoting justice and working actively in the cause of democracy. Shattering the hard-won peace of centuries, the Nazi hordes violated our borders in the early morning hours of April 9, 1940. Of course, they made no declaration of war, they just moved in. Overpowered our small army of 8,000 men in a few hours and spread the dark cloud of their presence over the whole of our nation. But the Danish resistance was not broken on that fateful morning. Under the surface, our people have been fighting ever since. The underground movement has, with increasing strength, hampered the Germans by using their most effective weapon, sabotage. In the spring and summer of 1943, sabotage increased. Trains carrying goods to Germany were derailed. Factories working for the enemy were burned to the ground. And German countermeasures were met with strikes all over the country. Many patriots were killed in action in those days. And many of our countrymen lost a father, a son, or a friend. Strikes continued. Shops and houses belonging to Danish Quislings were destroyed without any interference from the police corps. The mounting tension throughout the country led to the 29th of August, when the Nazis attacked our still remaining garrisons under cover of night. The German CNC in Denmark declared a state of military emergency. He referred to the international laws of warfare against an enemy country. Denmark was now fully at war with the German Reich. Crews of the Danish Navy scuttled their ships according to orders from the Admiralty. Here they are, still lying on the bottom of Copenhagen Harbor. Petersklam, Havrun, and the rest of them. Only a small part of the fleet managed to escape to Sweden. On the following Sunday morning, we were taught the Herrenfolk lesson. People were killed, arrested, and sent to concentration camps. German troops and tanks swarmed the streets. Pavements were overrun in a rude exhibition of Nazi arrogance. You had to be on the move not to be trampled to pieces. We had 2,900 of our own soldiers on the 29th of August. They were, they were in turn, their barracks turned into Nazi strongholds. The Rosenborg Castle, the quarters of the Royal Guard, was taken over by the Wehrmacht. Outside Fredericksburg Castle, anxious relatives were waiting for hours to have news of their men. Numerous Danish soldiers, as well as civilians, were killed. At their funeral, thousands of wreaths covered their coffins, despite German opposition. Flowers from the poorest in the land and from King Christian. King Christian was taken prisoner himself on that day. He and the government refused to negotiate with the Germans and ceased their functions, which from 1940 had been exercised under duress. His 73rd birthday, King Christian spent at Sorgenfree Castle, while goose-stepping Germans kept watch over their royal prisoner. But nothing could prevent the people of Copenhagen from honoring our beloved sovereign. Flags were flying from every house and every building. Only the Gestapo Citadel, Dogma hoops loomed in grim isolation without a flag. Lebensraum. Private houses were requisitioned, and with less than an hour's warning, people were thrown into the streets. The English phrase, do it well and do it now, became the slogan of our saboteurs. They painted it on walls when they blew up German military installations. And the Germans were fuming. To frighten us into submission and to quell the rebellion, the Germans invented a new system typical of their Herrenfolk terror. Some of our greatest men were ruthlessly murdered by a Nazi murder league. The clergyman Kai Mook, a cornerstone of the church, a great poet and immortal dramatist, was lured out of his vicarage at Vedozo and murdered in the darkness of night by Gestapo agents. We had but one reply to these Nazi murders sabotage and increased resistance. A curfew was ordered from nine o'clock at night, but in spite of this and the German control, saboteurs went to work. Factories working for the German were burnt down. 
And as beacons of freedom, the fires blazed through the darkest blackout. In desperation, the Germans tried counter-sabotage, or Schalbotage, as we call it. This counter-sabotage was carried out by the Schalberg Corps, the Danish Quisling Corps, which owed its name to the Danish collaborator and Nazi organizer von Schalberg. Film companies who refused every form of collaboration were blown up. Here are the Nordisk film studios at Hellerup. Department stores and whole streets lost their windows. Ilum was wrecked, Fronesbeck, Magazin, and many others. Many public buildings were blown up. Here you see the world famous Royal Yacht Club Pavilion, situated in Copenhagen Harbor, blown to pieces by the Schalberg Corps as a retaliation for a clever piece of sabotage on a factory making spare parts for the Luftwaffe. This is what is left of a beautiful place known to all of us. Even the innocent Tivoli, the world famous amusement park situated in the center of our capital, became a Nazi victim. One night, the Schalberg Corps blew up the greater part of our Tivoli, which for more than 100 years has had a great place in our hearts. This is the concert hall, or rather, the remnants of the concert hall. But sabotage did not stop. The syndicate, our biggest armament factory, was blown up in June 1944. A curfew was again enforced, from 8 o'clock at night until 6 in the morning. Danes never like to go to bed at 8 o'clock on a beautiful summer evening, so we simply refused. At 8 o'clock, the streets were crowded, and huge fires were made everywhere. The Schalberg Corps shot and killed our citizens in the streets. We got fed up, and the most peculiar general strike ever seen began. It started on a Friday morning, without any preceding propaganda or any organization to push it. People just went home, and within a few hours, everything had stopped. The German CNC declared Copenhagen under a state of siege. The town was surrounded by German troops and cut off from the outer world. Guns were placed in all the squares, and German armored cars patrolled the streets, shooting and harassing the civilian population. The underground Danish Freedom Council endorsed the strike, issued a proclamation demanding the Germans withdraw immediately, raised the curfew, and send the Schalberg Corps out of the capital. The Germans wouldn't hear of it, and the strike went on. The Union Jack and the Stars and Stripes were raised everywhere. Tipperary could be heard in the streets. Department stores belonging to Danish Quisling were burnt down. This is Bulldog, the Nora Brewer department store. We had hundreds of casualties during those days. The ambulance service was the only one working. And all day long, you could hear their sirens. The strictest rationing system of food and water was imposed by ourselves. Water was fetched from the lakes, and volunteers brought it to the hospitals where it was greatly needed. After five days, the Germans gave in. They agreed to Danish claims. One week later, Freedom Council proclaimed two minutes silence in commemoration of our fallen comrades. An unarmed population had won a victory over the Nazi war machine. Our day of liberation is near at hand. We know that, and we have confidence. But meanwhile, our resistance movement continues its fight. And the spirit of Denmark lives on. <laughs> 